I'm Erin Cahill, Digital Marketing and Communications Manager at the Case Foundation. It is an honor to join you today and introduce two greatly acclaimed authors and leaders. Today's event will be led by Gene Case, Chairman of the National Geographic Society and CEO of the Case Foundation and Case Impact Network. Her work focuses on unleashing business and capital as powerful forces for change and supporting investors to use their capital to promote social change through impact investing. Jean will speak with Dr. Robert Putman and Shailen Romney Garrett about their new book, The Upswing, how America came together a century ago and how we can do it again. The conversation will draw out inspiring lessons on how we can once again become a society based in community and bring forward solution for our modern times. Dr. Robert Putman is the Malkin Research Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University and has written 15 books translated into 20 languages, including Making Democracy Work, Civic Traditions in Italy, and Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. Both books are among the most cited and best-selling social science works of the last half century. His most recent bestseller, Our Kid, The American Dream in Crisis, chronicled the growing class gap among American youth. In 2006, Bob received the world's highest accolade for a political scientist, and in 2013, President Obama awarded him the National Humanities Medal, the nation's highest honor for contributions to the humanities. He has also received 16 honorary degrees from eight countries, including the University of Oxford in 2018. The other half of this dynamic duo is Shailen Romney Garrett, a writer and change maker pursuing connection, community, and healing in a fragmented world. Her work includes revealing portraits of religious communities across the United States. Her book, American Grace, How Religion Divides and Unites Us, won the Woodrow Wilson Award for Best Political Science Book of 2010, 2011. Shailen is also a founding contributor to Aspen Institute's Weave, The Social Fabric Project, and writes about her personal journey back to, me, to community in her blog, Project Reconnect. She's also had a successful career as a social entrepreneur and with her husband, James, co-founded Think Unlimited, a nonprofit venture working to catalyze social innovation in the Middle East. I'm so looking forward to this dialogue and want to encourage you to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen to ask questions as you listen. We'll begin with remarks from Bob and Shailen, followed by moderated discussion with Jean. And we'll reserve that time at the end to answer some questions from the audience. So don't forget to send us those throughout the talk. And now let me warmly welcome Jean Kings. Well, hello everyone, and thank you, Erin, for that great introduction of these two remarkable people that we're gonna have the chance to talk with today and ask some questions of. And as Erin just said, you know, we're gonna start out with some slides, but I hope throughout you'll be sending us questions because we really do wanna spend plenty of your time at the end with your questions. Um, so we've just been so excited about this day. You see, I have the book behind me, but I also have the book here that I've gone through in great detail. And, you know, I think like so many other works that Bob Putnam is better known for, um, it really is a book that brings forward a super interesting set of trends and facts to show us both where we've been and where we can go. As Erin said, the subtitle is How America Came Together a Century Ago and how we can do it again. And Bob and I go way back, but Shaylin and I are newer to each other, but Shaylin, it's such an honor to have you with us today. And I just love this dynamic duo that's cross-generational, you know, man, woman, bringing very different perspectives to the story that you tell in the book and the facts that you bring forward. So I wanna get out of the way a little bit other than to just say, you know, super, super grateful to both of you. Bob, you and I go back over 20 years. I think, you know, our work in civic engagement, which goes back decades, you informed dramatically in our earliest days. And then we did work together, of course, at the White House some number of years ago. We've had Bob come and do offsites with us at the Case Foundation again, to inform and, and really bring a perspective uh, about the world. And Sheila, we're using your work for that, uh, for that same purpose these days. So super delighted, super honored to have you both. And I know you have some slides that you wanna start with to kind of set the scene. So why don't we turn to the slides and I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Thanks very much, uh, Jean. Um, you know, you and I uh, are kind of a mutual admiration society and I could go on at great length 
um, about how much I've learned from you over the years and how much I've enjoyed our friendship. But if I did that um, adequately, we wouldn't get on to the rest of the events today. So I'm going to start here um, with uh, a couple of um, Shailen and I are going to start here by showing you some pictures. Um, very, except for this first slide, very few of them are going to be text slides. I'm mainly going to show you pictures, and I'm a kind of data person, so I'm going to be showing you some, uh, a number of, of charts that show how America has changed over the last uh, 125 years. And they're going to all look like that chart that's on the on that you're looking now at the title of the book, the, the title page, I mean, the um, cover page of the book, and you see there's a red line there and that, that because that's gonna summarize the basic empirical statistical backbone of the study. If we have the next slide, you'll see what I'm gonna be talking about today. Here's, the, here's where we begin. How are we doing in America today? That's something I'm sure is actually on every, almost every American's mind. How did we, what's in the world is happening to us? Because we're, and I'm now speaking as a statistician, we have rarely, if ever, been as polarized as a country politically as we are now. We've rarely, if ever, been as economically unequal as we are now. It's a little hard to measure, but by many measures, we have rarely been as socially isolated from one another as we are now. And finally, and here we, we went to a lot of trouble to try to get really hard measures of this, we have rarely been as self-centered, as narcissistic, as a people, as we are right now. So the first question we wanna ask is how did we get here? And I'm gonna talk mostly about that, but then eventually we wanna to get to the real question, which is, okay, how do we get out? Or rather, what can we learn from history that's relevant to where we are now? And Shailen's gonna talk about that. If we have the next slide, I'll show you this. They're all gonna look basically the same. So let's start, this is the slide on the trends on economic equality. Um, the, the underlying measures here are trends in things like um, the distribution of income, how the gap between rich folks and poor folks, or the distribution of wealth, or the, the opportunity for kids to move uh, upward in the, in the um, you know, to make more than their parents did or not. Uh, we have many different measures of economic, and some, to some extent also things like health equality, the difference, the gap between rich folks and poor folks in terms of their health. And you can see that's the vertical axis. You can see that um, the data here begin in 1910. They begin then because that's when the, um, the uh, IRS was first created. And that's when we begin to get really good hard data on income distribution. And you can see America was at that point pretty unequal. That was called the Gilded Age in American history. And that gilded because it, there was a huge gap between rich folks living on the Upper East Side of New York and poor folks living in the slums in the Lower East Side of New York. But then you see that beginning in the 1910s, uh, we begin to get a little more equal and we go up the line a little bit. We reach, a, we make some serious progress until about 1920. Then there, during the twenties, there's a kind of a pause. That's the roaring twenties, but then coming out of the twenties and for the next 30 or 40 years, you can see we're steadily every year becoming a little more equal. The gap between rich folks and poor folks is becoming narrower. That continues up into the forties and into the fifties and into the sixties. And then at the just about oh don't go you're going a little too far but because I wanted to say that we sort of reach a peak about 1960 the gap America in 1960 is about as equal probably as it has ever been but then we and we still stay pretty equal for quite a while for a couple of two decades but then beginning around 1980 we begin to plunge and every year we become much and much less and less connected I mean um, uh, equal to one another and actually if the graph continued down to 2020, we know, I know very well, and all of you do too, that the gap between rich folks and poor folks has accelerated even in the last four or five years. So we're now down as a country to about where we were 125 years ago, another gilded age. But it's not just economics. Let's turn to the next slide, which shows here we're going to measure in the next slide, we're going to look at here we call it political comedy. That's just the, the bipartisanship, the degree to which people are cooperating up, across party lines. And of course, you all know that at the moment, there's, there's virtually no political cooperation across, about, about, across party lines. Again, there are a lot of different measures here. I won't go through the particular measures, but we have lots of hard measures. One of them, for example, is the degree to which um, people in Congress cooperate across party lines. And you can see that that was pretty rare. America was very polarized, little, little bipartisanship, little of what we're calling comedy here. 
in around 1900, 1890, 1900. That, but then again, beginning in around 1900, 1910, suddenly there's more cross-party collaboration, more people, like Republicans and Democrats working together on shared goals, keep going, and we and that keeps we keep more and more connecting with one another. And pause with the middle 50s there. We, what you see in the middle 50s is that we're um, that's the Eisenhower years. Eisenhower was probably the least partisan president in American history, except for except for George Washington. But then, then we stopped. We you know we we reached kind of a peak then, and then you can see it be, as we go on to the the rest of the 50s and the 60s and beginning in the 70s, we begin to become we begin to become more polarized again, less and less cross party collaboration, and again dropping down steadily. This is a story we all know, keep going and it just keeps going. And by the time we get down to now, about down at the bottom 2015, America is now about as polarized as it's possible to be. You, if you ask how many Republicans in Congress vote with the Democrats and how many Democrats in Congress vote with the Republicans, it's about 95 to 98% of the time people are voting only with their own party. It can't get any more polarized than that. And you can see we're already more polarized than they were back in the, in the, in the early part of the 20th century. Let's have the next slide and I'll move quickly here through these. This is the third dimension. This we're calling social cohesion. When I, in my more academic moods, I call this social capital. But this, what this uh, chart shows is that this, is, this measures things like the degree to which we uh, are members of community organizations like, you know, um, I don't know, uh, volunteer, voluntary organizations. The National Geographic, there's a good example. Um, National Geographic, I think it was founded maybe in 1819, sorry, 1888, something like that is that. And you can almost see, if you look really closely, you can see the National Geographic over there on the far left part of the graph. And at that point is when we start becoming more connected, joining more groups like, like um, uh, National Geographic. Our families start becoming, at that point, our families were surprisingly, um, family, family, the family, which is of course the, the the core unit of society was surprisingly ill-formed. That is, there were a lot of bachelors and spinsters then, that is lots of Americans in that, I'm, wait, but don't go get too back because I'm, I'm talking about the 1890s now. In that period, there were lots of people who remained bachelors and spinsters all their lives and, and, and or they got married very late and they didn't have kids. And, and there are many men, we can measure social trust over this period and so on. I won't go through the methodological details, but you can see <coughs> pardon me again, as you go into the teens and 20s, um, uh, we're getting more and more connected with our neighbors and our family and so on. And then there's this, there's again that pause in the 20s, but then coming out of that period in the 40s and 50s, probably the greatest civic boom in American history. Everybody's joining, everybody's having kids and everybody's getting married and they're getting married young and we're all connected. And then suddenly, middle 60s right about there we start becoming we stop going to so many club meetings and after a while we not go to club meetings at all and we're and and uh, and we're we begin to trust other people less and we're we're less likely to for example go to church and all these ways in which we connect with our family and our community and our neighbors and so on they begin to and that's the that's the part of this whole story that i told about in bowling alone bowling alone is basically about a, a little part of this larger big graph and but then in this graph, we've carried it on now well past Bowling Alone because Bowling Alone was published about 2000. If you go down to 2000, that's where I stopped my story about Bowling Alone. And you can see it just kept going downhill almost as if I predicted it. And now we're down, it's a little hard to know exactly the measures. We're now down almost to where we began the century, very disconnected. Kids are marrying. Many kids never get married. I don't just mean uh, have the formalities, but many kids never form uh, permanent partnerships. Um, if they do, it's late in life. When my wife and I got married up at the, up the peak up there, we were married when we were, I think, 20, 21. Um, our kids who got married when they were in their late 20s and our grandchildren, who are now, none of them still married, although they're in their late 20s, they can't imagine what in the world their grandparents were doing getting married at such an early age. So we can see this kind of, this curve can be seen in many parts of our lives. If we have the next slide. Um, in the next slide is about cultural solidarity. I wish I had time to tell you more about the underlying measures here because I'm really proud of the, we, we did some really pretty innovative things in being able to measure the, um, the degree to which we are either 
America's culture has been either uh, narcissistic and inward focused and self-centered or more outward looking and more connected and more thinking of what we have in common rather than thinking about only ourselves. And you can see what the curve looks like here. Um, I will just say one measure that we used in a sense gave the name to all these curves. And that is we looked at the degree, this is, it's amazing you could do this, but we looked at the degree in which in American popular literature, that is in things like mystery stories and, and um, crime stories and I mean, uh, uh, gardening books and all sorts of American literature, we looked to see the relative frequency of just two words. What's the frequency of we and I? And when you do that graph, that graph looks exactly like this chart. That is back in the beginning in the 1890s, the only thing our books were talking about were I. But gradually we got more and more our, our literature, in our literature, not politics, this is just our ordinary culture. We begin, the word we begins to appear more and writers and readers are focused more on we, what we have in common. That reaches its peak in 1964. I'm conscious of that date because 1964 is the day is the peak of this of this we curve. It also happens to be the first year I voted, and there's an argument that maybe I personally caused this whole cycle by voting for the first time in 1964. Anyway, you can see it, it goes sharply down, and by now we're back. And you don't need to be told my these. We're in a very self-centered period now. We're 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 focused on my health, my safety, and I'm not worried about whether other people are going to get the virus. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that illustrates the point. So this curve, if we go to the next slide and then actually go quickly to the next slide, this, the next slide, this summarizes the whole thing. And we call this the I, we, I curve for reasons, meaning over at the left-hand side, we're in a very, America was in a very I period, unequal, politically combative, socially disconnected, narcissistic. Then by the middle of the century, up around 1960, we reached a peak in which we were much more equal, less polarized, more cooperative, more focused on what we shared with other people than on our own self-interest. And now we're back down in an I period. But that just sets the stage for what we really want to talk about, which is so what? What are the differences it make to us? And Shailen, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can pick up the story there. Great. So um, if we can just go back to the other slide for just a moment, I think, you know, there's been a whole genre of books in the last decade or so written about how we got here, the sort of how, why America is in such a mess genre, you might call it. Um, and a lot of these books look to some sort of supposed, supposed golden age in the past that we need to sort of go back to, right? And there's a way that you could look at this graph and the many others that Bob has presented here and say, oh, that's, you know, that's the lesson here that we need to get back to that sort of peak of weeness um, that was happening in the 1960s. On the contrary, what we actually believe is that the most instructive part of this curve is not when we peaked in our um, we moment, but actually the most instructive moment is when the last time we were in a situation very similar to the one that we're in today. Back in the 1890s on the far left side of this graph, it was a remarkably similar, measurably similar moment to what we are in living through today. And yet, and there were many commentators who worried that democracy had gone off the rails and that America was about to fail as an experiment. But in fact, we see what? instead of going off the rails, we actually turned upward and entered this phase of ever increasing communitarian, ever increasing equality, comedy, and all of the other things that Bob has highlighted. And so we believe that if ever there were sort of a historical moment whose lesson we need to learn, it is that moment when the Gilded Age, which is what um, this period in the 1890s was referred to as, gave way to the progressive era when all of these trends started to reverse, move in more positive direction, and we saw a multifaceted upswing in American history, which is of course where our book gets its name. So if we could go to the next slide, what we wanna do is just quickly highlight a few of the lessons from that last upswing. These are lessons that come both from the data that Bob has presented, but also from the historical record about what was really going on in America during that time. So the first thing that we see is actually a huge moral and cultural shift happening during the progressive era. Um, many people think 
that if we could just identify the one variable that turned first of all those different variables that Bob um, presented, then we would know what thing we should work on first. And often the assumption is that the first thing that turned was economics, that we began, began to address the economic inequality. And once that happened, all the other stuff came with it. When in fact, it turns out that economics are a lagging indicator which is a big surprise for a lot of people. And what it appears might be the leading indicator is actually a moral and cultural shift. So the lesson there is that if we want a starting point, it may well be to look to our core values as a society. And that's certainly what was happening in the progressive era. It was a time when the social Darwinist culture of the Gilded Age, the dog eat dog survival of the fittest mindset gave way to something called the social gospel which was a movement that tried to challenge our primary conceptions. What kind of men and women do we want to be? It was a sort of um, historian, Richard Hofstetter called it a moral indignation directed inward. Many of the people who led the progressive era were themselves elites, but they were in a sense sort of chastened elites. Elites who had begun to see their own complicity in the problems that they were seeing around them. And they started to begin um, with that inwardly directed self-critique and then took that out into the world. So that's one of the lessons we can learn today um, about what an important starting point a moral and cultural shift will be for America. The second lesson here is that this movement, these progressives, they were an incredibly diverse coalition of people. And within the coalition, there were competing factions who often disagreed about a lot of things. But what they shared was this galvanizing belief that citizens could change the course of history. And many of these citizen activists were incredibly young. We often think of progressives like Jane Addams and we see pictures of her you know, later in life when she won the Nobel Peace Prize. And we think of her as this older woman when in fact she was in her twenties when she started the first settlement house in America. And many of, the, many of the leaders of the progressive era were very young. So we believe that today America's fate once again lies largely in the hands of young people as it did then. They will be the ones who will lead us, um, lead us to another upswing. Um, and, and we really need to look to their innovation, their outside the box thinking in the same way um, as what happened last time. Another lesson here is that the progressives really, for them association, bringing people together was both an end and a means. What I mean by that is that these progressives were actively fighting the hyper-individualism of their age by literally inventing new ways to bring people together. This was an era characterized by loneliness. Um, there had been a huge shift in the Industrial Revolution, Revolution of people moving out of towns and farms and into the big cities where they were lonely, isolated, dislocated, and they had to create new ways of bringing people together. Many of the ways to bring people together that the progressives um, invented, brought people together across lines of difference, across lines of class. Um, and those face-to-face -face ties that were created through these associations built a vast store of social capital that really fueled the upswing for decades, as we saw in those graphs. Another um, note here is that sort of the, the progressives focused on the grassroots. They were working in what Louis Brandeis, who was a famous progressive, called the laboratories of democracy neighborhoods, tenements, small towns and cities, municipalities who were looking to solve the problems that were right outside their doorsteps. And as they found solutions, those solutions began then to bubble up and get attention and started to sort of go viral across the country and then ultimately became the blueprint for the bigger national programs that came to ultimately characterize the progressive era. So again, today we believe once again, in order to see another upswing, we need to look to those um, grassroots levels to see where to begin uh, with the new ideas that will move America forward. The next point here is that charismatic leadership was really a lagging indicator. Again, when we think of the progressive era, we often think of Teddy Roosevelt, right? And certainly leaders like Teddy Roosevelt came along and ultimately were able to get bipartisan support for big reforms like consumer protections and trust busting and child labor legislation and conservation. But actually those ambitious federal programs were sort of the caboose and not the engine of change. They built upon um, the coalition building and the grassroots work 
uh, that had been going on for a couple of decades before those national programs came onto the scene. So today the lesson is of course that the I alone um, political leaders are not going to be our salvation. They will likely come toward the end of this process. And the last um, point that I'll just make here, last lesson from the upswing is that the, you know, the progressive era was not all positives. Um, these progressives that we are lauding in our book and looking to for lessons, many of them were racist. Many of the structural inequalities that we are having to really stare in the face today uh, were created in large measure through a lot of the reforms that were created in this era. Um, in some ways, the needs of people of color were really sort of sacrificed on the altar of progress. And this is something that we certainly can't repeat. This is a mistake that we cannot afford to make again, to sort of kick racial justice down the road. Um, we have to make a more inclusive we, a real central piece of any upswing that we would hope to see today. And we can speak a little bit more about the role of race in this story later on if, if uh, there's interest in that. But this is something that we really like to highlight that today's upswing, we hope it will, it will be driven by all of these things and that it will have within it a true inclusive we that we did not see um, during the last upswing in American history. So if we can just go to the last slide, we'll leave you with this thought from Teddy Roosevelt. Um, the fundamental rule of our national life, he said, the rule which underlies all others, is that on the whole and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. So it's our hope that we can create another upswing today. We did it once before, we can do it again. And that's the message that we really wanna leave with you today. Wow, thanks for that, Bob and Shaylin. I think that really does a great job of setting the tone for this conversation. And as I jump into questions, please feel free to send us your questions because we're gonna move to those in just about 10 or 15 minutes. And we really wanna hear from you. So there's so many questions and I have to say, the surprising thing about the book was the surprises, things that I sort of understood to be a certain way and through the trends and data you brought forward, I was really surprised. And, you know, Bob, I want to go to you first because you talked about you first voting in 1964, but you make the case, for instance, as we saw that peak in so many of the curves, which was right around that Kennedy era, you make the case that when President Kennedy stood, you know, before the nation during his inauguration, and really called on people to act in shared interests, not self-interest. You described that in many cases, we thought it was revelry, the start of a new day, but it turns out unknowingly it was a little bit of taps because it was the end of an era where that, was, that progress had right. taken place. So can you talk a little bit about what's behind that? What do we think about that time was significant to begin to cause a shift downward then from the progress we have been making? Yeah, Shailen, this is uniquely a question for me because you weren't around then, and I'm maybe the only person on this whole damn, whole darn uh, 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 program here that, that can remember vividly that, because I was actually, um, forgive me, Gene, for getting, for getting personal here. Um, I actually went to that, the Kennedy inaugural personally, and I stood in the snow on the, in, in, in the east front of the Capitol where uh, inaugurations were then held. And I heard him with my own ears say, ask not what you can do for your country, ask what you can, ask not what the country can do for you, ask what you can do for the country. And it had a hugely, I, this is not a story in Bob Putnam's autobiography, but I have to say a lot of my own personal life was changed because I thought it was, I was an adolescent, right? And I thought he was speaking to me. And a lot of us of that, era were enormously, I mean, my life was transformed, honestly. I don't want to get choked up about it here, but it was. That's when I decided I wanted to work to see if I could make America a better place. I, it, I was an adolescent. I don't want to get too serious about it. But nevertheless, it was true of that period that we thought we were about to go into this. And then it just went exactly the opposite direction. So the question is, what happened in the 60s? The 60s was really divided into two halves. If you lived through it, you know this although they get, tend to get smudged together. The first half of the 60s actually was the culmination. You can see this in all these graphs, the culmination of this long 60 or 70 year period of ever greater togetherness. So that was the period of the communes and the, you know, the Peter Paul, I mean, the, 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 the folk songs were all about togetherness and so on. And, and, and we thought at the time that we were getting finally to 
get over this last barrier, which we knew was race. We thought at last America's going to get over this. And I did not personally go south. I had a lot of friends who went south in freedom marches. It looked like we were going to finally break through to a new America. And but then came the second half of the 60s. In the second half of the 60s, America kind of did a backflip in the middle of the 60s. And the second half of the 60s um, was, um, was the opposite. Um, and, and we began be suddenly becoming less focused on ourselves. Inequality began to change. Polarization began to appear. And if you talk to different people of that era as to what they think the turning point was, it's interesting that they all, everybody names a different thing. If you're my age, you th the first thing you think of is the assassinations. Uh, that is uh, the assassination of Jack Kennedy and, and uh, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy and so on. Um, and, uh, people a little bit later will focus on something else like the Vietnam War. Um, and many people think, well, it's only about the Vietnam War, but actually it wasn't only about the Vietnam War. Some people focus on the rapid change in sexual mores, the fact that overnight, really almost overnight, it became okay to have premarital sex. It was a, probably the most rapid change in personal moral standards in American history, maybe in world history, because within three or four years, it went from being, nobody talked about or did, well, I don't know what they did, but they didn't talk okay about, about premarital sex until everybody was doing it. It was just amazingly, so people, some people talk about that, and some people think that the pill caused that, and other people talk about, I don't know, the urban riots and the, and the uh, civil rights movement. And so different people have different things that would cause the 60s. They were actually all unrelated. There was no connection between Vietnam and the Peel or between the assassinations and the, and the um, uh, I don't know, the urban riots or whatever, there are a lot of, or the, the gas lines and the, and the oil embargoes. In our memory, we shove those all together as the 60s, but actually it wasn't. And I think the, really think that the fact the reason we turned around was that America kind of had a nervous breakdown. So many independent crises struck all aspects. It's not that it was just one crisis. It was everything was falling apart. In any event, we came out of that period going in exactly the opposite direction. I've told you more about the 60s than I'm sure you wanted to know. That's because I, I'm a creature of the 60s. But, I, it was a, but it's clearly not, this is the, the main point that Shailen was making, and, and I completely agree. It's not that we want to go back to the 60s. That's not the you know, the, the, our, our, current right. president for the, our current president for the next month or so keeps talking back about what America was great and he wants to make America great again. That's not what we want to do. We want to recreate the it's, the, it's the excitement of that early part of the 20th century when people were beginning to create things in a new positive way, not the fading of that, that we think ought to be the focus of our attention. Right, and then similarly, Shailen, you know, you're such an expert on the Gilded Era. And, you know, I was really fascinated to read a number of different things in the book. And I think many of us understand it was a time where there was outsized wealth and a few people prospering significantly while others were not, et cetera. And we see those correlations. But I'd love for you to talk about two things, the cor more correlations that you see that cause you to kind of reflect on that time as similar to this time. And then your first point in the summary of the slides was the moral and cultural shift mm -hmm. that took place following that era, coming out of that era. I'd just love to know and hear more from you about what, what was behind that moral and cultural shift? What, you know, what are some of the things we could look for that might suggest that could come again? Sure. You know, it was interesting. Um, Bob and I knew, of course, I mean, that, that a lot had been written about the Gilded Age being similar to today. Um, but you're right that it focused mostly on the economic inequality. And as we looked really deep into the historical um, record of this period, it was, it was a little bit shocking, almost unsettling, like how many layers of similarity there were. Um, and that's what we really go over in detail in the introduction to the book. I mean, but so things like... Um, corporate monopolies and um, vast income inequality and class segregation, um, pollution, contaminated products getting into the marketplace, um, a zero sum power struggle in the public square, um, populism and socialism becoming popular alternatives to mainstream political parties, um, corporate power translating into political power and that being a really scary, dangerous thing, nativism and a suspicion of immigrants, um, loneliness and isolation and despair, a lot of disillusionment and despair. There's a, there were a lot of cultural narratives about despair 
Um, but at the same time, there was also a lot of nostalgia for a bygone era. You had a sort of older generation going, oh, America used to be so great when we lived on the farms. How, how familiar does that sound, right? Um, and scandals dominating the media, crime and moral decay being like the subjects of popular entertainment, um, a fevered pace and anxiety, um, and a lot of commentators foretelling disaster, which I mentioned. So like it, it just, the parallels are almost, it almost gives you goosebumps to hear sort of that list, right? Um, so I, I think it's, it's instructive in a lot of ways and, and you think, you know, what happened when these people looked around and saw all of this multifaceted national crisis, so similar to the one that we saw today, amazingly, the progressives who came out as leaders of the next phase of American history, they started with the heart work. That's what I like to call it, right? right. They started looking inward. It would have been very easy to go, oh, the idle rich or, oh, the corrupt politicians, they're the ones causing all the problems. And to a certain extent that was there, um, but there was a lot of, of um, a lot of call for a moral change of heart, a sort of revolution of the heart. And that's actually what drove people who otherwise would have been elites. Frances Perkins is a great example. She was on the path to just sort of live this New York socialite life. And she saw the Triangle Shirtwaist fire happening when women and girls, immigrant women and girls who had been working in a factory that caught fire were literally jumping to the street to their death to escape this. And it, it, get, it something shifted in her where she said, I can't do this life of luxury anymore. I've got to get in there and fight for these women. And there are so many stories when you look at the progressive leaders of that kind of internal shift, driving them into the public square, forcing them to look hard at their own lives and at the structures that were creating these problems and work to change them. And there was a lot, there were a lot of, I could go on and on here. There were a lot of religious narratives that were coming yeah. into play um, where, where we were being, where people were being asked to shift actually the narrative of religion itself, Christianity itself had become highly individualized. Uh, a sort of, you know, um, Christianity is there to sort of prop up the elite class, right? Which is the opposite of what you read in the New Testament, right? And so there were leaders that came along and said, wait a minute, this is not Christianity. Christianity is about taking care of the oppressed, those who are left behind. This should be our blueprint for society. And they started to reinterpret even scriptural narrative to help us reclaim a we. And that motivated a lot of the cultural rethinking of this period. You know, I think that's a, a great topic to bridge to the next question for Bob. You know, I mentioned, Bob, we were, you know, we've really been schooled by you through the years we've been working in civic engagement. And, um, you know, one of the things the book highlights, and Shaylin was just referring to it, is really almost a civic inventedness or, um, right. you know, what do we want to say, civilian innovation, you know, really that sense or citizen innovation, it's almost that sense what Shailen was just saying, but enough is enough and we have to find a different way forward. In right. our work with entrepreneurs, of course, we see that's how great companies are born all the time. They see a problem and they build a solution to solve it. And we know there have been social entrepreneurs you know, really even dating back to the founding of National Geographic. So sure. um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, what that was like and who played a role and, and, and how vibrant that was, because you talk a lot about it in the book. Yeah, it, it is actually, you know, it's amazing, in fact, to think that you have to invent anything. I mean, you know, these are, we, we've lived so long with National Geographic or with Rotary Club or with bowling leagues that we you don't think does somebody actually had to invent Rotary Club for goodness sakes and it's only <laughs> when you get yourself back into that period and not looking at it you know with the benefit of 100 years hindsight that you see well that the guy who and I'm not I'm not just joking I'm the guy who invented Rotary the young was a young kid he just moved to Chicago so forget about the fact that he's going to end up being the creator of Rotary. He's a young kid. He just moved to Chicago. He didn't know anybody in Chicago. And he didn't really have any, you know, business connections, or any kind of connections. And he said, how can we fix this? And he had this bright idea. Suppose I had some friends get together for lunch and we sort of talk about how our day has gone and what, what progress we're making. And so if you, I'm trying to make it seem like a pretty innocent little thing, and, and but really clever because no one was doing that. Nobody in Chicago 
you know, he was the first guy in Chicago and maybe the first guy in the country had the idea, let's get together for lunch. You have to see it that way. And then, then realize, God, from that came this whole millions and millions of people ever having lunch together all over the world at the same time and talking about, you know, doing good deeds. That's what it was about. Well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to romanticize Rotary. I am trying to, though, to create this sense that it required thinking anew, not being stuck. And that's partly why they were all young, Gene. They were young, old folks. I'm, I would love to have this happen, but the ideas for how we're gonna reorganize the next, the next upswing, the, I, the specific ideas are not gonna come from me because people, they're, only really young people can get, think outside the box. Does this make sense? So that's why we place, Shailen and I place great hopes. Indeed, we originally wrote the book with the idea we we're gonna to try to appeal to young people. You guys are the ones who can do it. And I mean, really young, I'm talking about people in their twenties right now. And you know, you can look around now and see there are some examples that maybe that's taken off. I mean, the fact that Greta Thunberg, the person who's leading the, the world uh, movement toward, toward uh, in face of global warming, is this a kid or the, I never can remember the name of the, pair of kids who after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, you know, led us all to be focus on, on right. gun control. Well, they were kids. And what I'm trying to say is we should not look upon that. Isn't that weird? We should, that's exactly what it should look like if we're gonna, if we're gonna create new forms of connection. Does that make sense, Jean? Makes total sense. And as you well know, we've been publishing uh, around millennials. We did a decade long study on their attitudes and perceptions around social good. And, you know, I really, that work was born out of seeing a generation that like all young generations were idealistic, but they were turning their idealism into action. So when I really read about the focus on how young people influence sort of thoughts and behaviors and systems and structures, it gave me great hope for this next upswing. Sure. So we have a couple of questions from the audience that I wanna uh, put your way. Uh, John writes, were there any lessons learned about the upswing as it relates to urban versus rural areas? Shailen, you want to go for that? Um, or, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> there, it, there were a lot. Urban rural was in some sense the major di divide in that country. Right. The more you know about that period, the more you think I'm making this up because it's so like the big, the big controversy in that period was between urban and rural folks. Mm -hmm. And because that was the economic divide, the people in the city and the people in the country, and they thought of themselves as being on opposite sides. How that worked out actually is really interesting too, because this, this is another example of how this progressive era has lessons for us. Mm -hmm. Gradually people, some people in the urban areas and some people in the rural, rural, rural areas, especially work then I'm speaking about then workers in urban areas and farmers in sorry did I say that right workers in urban areas and farmers in rural areas saw they had a shared interest mm -hmm. in um, the fact that they were both being screwed by this I'm sorry they were both being exploited by this big uh, these big national monopolies and so that I, I, I forgot the name of the person who asked the question it's a brilliant question because what it says is Look at, look at that period, and they did what we, in jargon, call bridging social capital. That is, they made alliances that cut across the main lines of cleavage. So I don't think I have to be explicit about that. That means today we ought to be thinking about how folks who live in urban areas have shared interests with folks who live in rural areas. And I don't have to go very far down that the next sentence or two before you realize I'm talking about exactly issues that are in front of our country this week, for goodness yeah. sakes. Right, well, right. We talk about it uh, as race, place, and gender playing a role yeah. uh, and really needing to focus on all of that. And Shailen, I, I wanna go to you if I can, because we do have a number of questions asking about what really was happening with race during the century and, and during both you know, the upswing and as we, we came down from it. And I know you have a slide maybe you can share, but the thing that I found as another surprise was really kind of how you talked about the progress that did take place. So can you expound a little bit on what you shared uh, on the subject of race in the book? Sure. So, um, I mean, the, the main question, of course, when we talk about the American we, 
is how does race play into the fact that we were moving in the direction of we during a period that was characterized by Jim Crow um, and, and by violent white supremacy in the South and even beyond the South. Um, so the question that we sort of stepped back to ask was, okay, well, was the racial gap narrowing in America over the course of the 20th century? If so, when and how rapidly, right? Because again, this is a book about trends. When were things changing? What direction were they moving in? So were we moving in the direction of equality or in the direction of inequality? And when was that direction happening? So that was the sort of motivating question as we tried to map the story of race onto or not the story of the IOEI curve. Um, and so if I could, well, let's let's not go to the slide quite yet. Just, just hold on one second. So I think, you know, those um, those graphs that Bob was showing, those are, those are inverted U curves. That's how we often refer to them, right? All of those curves that looked like this. It looked like a rainbow, right? Um, charted against those inverted U curves, a lot of people think that racial progress, progress toward equality would look instead like a hockey stick, a flat line, no progress until sort of the lightning bolt changes of the 1960s. And then everything got suddenly better. And so that's kind of an accepted narrative about what progress toward racial equality looked like over the course of the 20th century. In fact, as we looked at the data, there were some surprises. In many ways, that is true. Um, when you look at things like longstanding lack of political representation, when you look at um, the re white supremacist representations in, in mainstream culture and media, uh, when you look at entry into professional schools and jobs. A lot of those would track that kind of no progress, then a lot of progress. But on a lot of other measures, particularly measures of material equality, it looks a lot different. So if we want to pull up that slide real quick, um, we can show you what that graph looks like. What you're about to see is a summary index of black white material equality over the course of the century. So if you look at the the um, y-axis there, what you're seeing is, you see at the top 1.0, that represents full equality between the races. And then we're of course on the x-axis tracking um, over the course of the century, right? So when we talk about material equality, what are we talking about? Things like life expectancy, infant mortality, high school enrollment, college completion, average earnings per worker, um, home ownership, household wealth. We're even including measures like um, voting um, voter registration and voter participation. And when you sort of lump all of those measures together, what you see here is actually not a hockey stick, right? What we see is actually gradual and, and certainly insufficient progress over the course of most of the first two thirds of the century, right? So the surprise here is that, I mean, of course we never reached anywhere close to full equality, right? Again, that's that 1.0 that we're looking at at the top. But there was a lot of progress made in the first two thirds of the century. Um, and then if you look right at, at 1970 on that graph, the progress actually then slows down. It was going fast and then it actually sort of flatlines. And on many of these individual measures, progress actually reverses, which is a really frightening um, reality. So. This, of course, prompts a couple of questions. One is, how was it that Black Americans were making this progress toward full equality during the Jim Crow period? And secondly, why, after the Civil Rights Revolution, did things not continue to skyrocket toward equality? Why did they flatline? And so when we map these, so, so one of the questions, one of the answers to that comes just from the historical record, which is, most of the progress that Black Americans were making had, had to do mostly with their own efforts to leave the South and move into the North and West. So that's the Great Migration, when millions of Black Americans moved out of the violent South and into the more hospitable North and were then able to access hospitals for the first time and go to school for the first time and own their own businesses and vote. Um, they were doing so in separate spheres from white Americans. And those separate spheres were of course often violently enforced, but they were nonetheless making progress toward equality. And that's an important thing. Again, it's not sufficient and it certainly wasn't enough and it certainly was imperfect in deep, deep ways, but it's also part of the story that doesn't get told. Um, and so when we map this graph onto sort of the I, we, I graph, the interesting thing is a lot of this progress toward material equality was taking place during the we decades. And then when we see this stagnation, 
that's happening right at the same moment that America turns from we to I. We can't say that the stagnation was caused by that broader we to I. Um, you know, we, we, it's, it's a little bit hard to tease out exactly what caused what here. We do know, however, that in the wake of the civil rights revolution, what we saw was a huge white backlash. Americans, you know, it was, it was right at the peak of that we moment that we were finally, as Bob mentioned, addressing race and doing so in a legal way that was tearing down legal barriers um, for black Americans. But then right when we did that, and all of the survey data really shows this, white Americans were like in favor of the Civil Rights Act, but not so much in favor of enforcing them or wanted to take it slow when it came to, to integration, right? And so there was a huge backlash on the part of white Americans when it became clear that, oh, the opening this we means that we have to share the pie in real ways. And so that, that's a lot of what drove this stagnation. And so um, I'll just wrap this up by saying, it's a really important story to tell because the lot of the, the protesting that we're seeing around the Black Lives Matter movement certainly is sparked by uh, police violence and, and the killing, the, the unwarranted violent um, police brutality and the killing of Black Americans. But it's taking place against this backdrop of intergenerational stagnation, right? When the promise of the civil rights movement actually sort of died on the vine, like right in the moment when we thought it was going to bear fruit. And, and our, our question for America is how much of this had to do with us in a, making a broader turn toward I, toward selfishness, toward a narrower self-interest across the board. And I think that's an interesting question as we look at race in America of what, again, going back to these moral values, what are going to be the real values that begin to inform our debates and discussions about racial justice? And if we can start to have those conversations, maybe we can begin to make more progress than we've seen in the last half century. Boy, thanks for that, Shaylin. I think that is fascinating. And if, if you're with us today, watching with us today, maybe you were surprised by what Shaylin just presented as well. It's really quite fascinating. Um, so we have time for one more audience question. And I have to say, uh, my dear friend, Catherine Bradley, who is a remarkable leader in her own right, uh, asks, does the closeness of our recent election and the split Congress make you pessimistic or optimistic <laughs> as to conditions that could start a new upswing? Uh, is it part of the problem or does it portend progress? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Might have to expand yeah. on that one. Um, we both have, we both have uh, thoughts about this. Shaden, why don't you start off and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up and talk about agency. You know, I've thought a lot about this, as you might imagine, um, as has Bob. And um, I think where I want to go with this is to say there's a concept that I've taken from Viktor Frankl called tragic optimism. The idea of tragic optimism is, is recognizing and getting really clear about how bad things are, but knowing that you still have the power to change them. And the optimism comes from that deep connection to your own agency no matter how bad things are around you. So I don't think that Bob and I have any motivation to say, oh no, things are definitely already getting better. <laughs> it's gonna be fine for a couple of reasons. One, we don't believe that this is some sort of historical roller coaster that we're riding or that, there is, that, that, that things will just naturally reach a, a nadir and then they will just sort of naturally turn back. We don't think that that's gonna, that is the way that this story goes. Things could definitely get worse but they could also turn around. And that's what the historical record shows us. And it shows us clearly, without a doubt, that there were Americans who woke up, who took the reins of history and took us in a completely different direction. If that happens today in mass, I think we can see another upswing for sure. We did it once, we can do it again. I I, I don't wanna, I, I, just, I wanna just underline that point because I think it's the most important point we're making in the book actually. Um, we were writing this book for, uh, we wrote it and finished it before the, before the uh, virus and before everything that's happened this year. It was in the, the book was done and then we, but it, publication was postponed because of the, of the virus and so on. Um, when we wrote it, we were writing it for young people and we wrote it to say to them, you can make a difference. And what we were concerned about was not whether young people today 
everybody, but especially young people, were <coughs> we weren't so much concerned about what their views were as we were concerned about their cynicism. You couldn't make a difference. And we wanted to say, look, look at the historical record. Don't just look at me lecturing you. Look at the historical record. These people changed history. They were not the prisoners of history. None of us are the prisoners of history. We sort of think we are. We like to think, you know, in the area of the, the internet, we think, you know, technology is forcing all this on us and it's going to either be good or bad. That's hogwash. If you look at the data, we're making choices all the time. And we can choose, I'm going to get off the internet part and back onto the, the, the history part that we're talking about here. We can choose, and especially young people can choose, if they want to move this country in a, right, in, the, in a better direction, and I think they do, then we can. And if they choose not to push against this, this trend, well, then we, it won't. I, I don't think it's so much a question about what do we expect to happen. It's a question of what do we want, and especially what do those young people want. Mm -hmm. I am, in a way, kind of optimistic, not because there's going to be a natural, you know, it's going to flow in this way, but I'm hopeful at least that what's happening right now is actually everybody, but young people in particular, waking up to this. And so I'm not talking about, neither of us are talking about what's going to happen in, you know, in the first six months of a Biden administration. We're looking at trends that, these trends began long before Trump was, you know, even awake as a person. And they're going to continue long after he leaves, no matter what he does. We're cons obviously Trump is an ap apotheosis of this kind of trend, but he didn't cause it. And his departure is not going to fix it. That's up to us. And on that longer term note, I'm very hopeful. I think that's a great place to end this conversation. And I'm going to hold the book up again, because if you haven't already ordered it during this conversation, I want to encourage you to do so. You know, my only frustration is that we only had an hour because I was telling Shaylin earlier, I felt like every chapter could literally be a book. It's just such a gift to all of us. And I think the sort of the best gift is that optimistic hope that we can have that when citizens come together, when they get engaged, when they address the challenges of their community and their nation more broadly, we see things really change. And um, I think that's been a big part of what your work, both of you, has been about for a long time. You know, I was thinking our work in stakeholder capitalism and impact investing. Most of those movements have been led by young people. Another vision of what capitalism can look like, et cetera. So we're seeing it around us already taking hold. And I know many that are joining us because I've seen some of the names are doing their own part today. But Bob and Shaylin, thanks so much for this really valuable hour and for the gift you've given us of the upswing. Thank you. Thank you. This has been great.